Greetings from Williamstown. On behalf of everyone here at the college, it's my honor to welcome you to tonight's event, a celebration of 2021 Bicentennial Medalist Bruce Grinnell, Williams Class of 1962. The Bicentennial Medals Program was created by the Bicentennial Commission on the occasion of the college's 200th anniversary in 1993 to quote, help build and strengthen ties with alumni, students, faculty, parents, and friends, and to increase their sense of pride in the college. The medals recognize and honor distinguished achievement in any field of endeavor by members of the Williams family. The 175 medal recipients to date span 70 years from the class of 1924 to the class of 2007. Another bicentennial milestone is being celebrated in 2021. Tonight's program is one of a year long series of events commemorating the 200th anniversary of the founding of the Williams College Society of Alumni. Our society is the oldest alumni association in North America and quite possibly the world. We're spending this bicentennial year, not only celebrating and grappling with our past, but also examining our present and imagining our future. Together, we envision an inclusive society where all alumni feel they belong. We are united in our shared commitment to a liberal arts education, to lifelong learning, and most especially to each other and our college. Tonight, we honor Bruce Grinnell, and I'll be back at the end of the program to confer the Bicentennial Medal to him. Mm -hmm. But first, I want to introduce Bruce and his partner in conversation this evening, Steve Lewis, a Williams icon in his own right. Stephen R. Lewis Jr., class of 1960, is president emeritus and professor of economics emeritus at Carleton College, where he served as president from 1987 to 2002. Steve received his PhD in economics from Stanford in 1963 and returned to Williams in 1966, spending the next 21 years in service to alma mater as professor of economics and in two separate terms as provost of the college. From January 2007 to December 2014, he was chairman of the board of Columbia Funds, 130 billion family of mutual funds, where he was a director from 2002 to 2014. Steve is a luminary in many fields, including development economics, most notably in Southern Africa, and of course in matters related to higher education and the liberal arts, where his name will be forever linked to two of its shining beacon, beacons in Carlton and Williams. Please join me in welcoming Steve. Bruce Grinnell, class of 1962, headed to Boston University School of Law shortly after graduating from Williams. Degree in hand, he returned to Williamstown and has been a professional and personal fixture in his community ever since. He formed his own law firm in 1971 and stewarded Grinnell Partners for almost 40 years until his retirement in 2020. In his volunteer time, Bruce has served organizations large and small in Berkshire County and has been honored by many for his commitment and dedication. It's worth noting that while I have not had the pleasure of seeing Bruce take on the fully costumed role of Ephraim Williams at Moments of Town and College Import, it is one he has played with aplomb. Please join me in welcoming Bruce. A few reminders before turning over our virtual stage to Steve and Bruce. Please feel free to utilize the chat as a space to engage with the community and share any reflections or comments you may have. And if you have any questions for Bruce, please utilize the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom toolbar at any time during today's talk. We'll have dedicated time for Q&A at the end of the presentation, but you can submit your questions as you think of them. Welcome, Steve and Bruce. Thanks, Maude, very much. And uh, it's, it's a huge privilege for me to be here with uh, Bruce Grinnell, who I think is had an impact on uh, Williams that is very, very few people uh, in other fields could possibly imagine. Um, uh, let me just start by giving a little bit of history that, that, and then ask Bruce to start, start off with his remarks. Um, when, when I arrived in, at Williams in 1956 and Bruce in uh, 1958, we found a fraternity system that had 15 fraternities, virtually no undergraduates in our classes ended up not being in fraternities. 
Um, and the, the school's uh, social and residential life had been dominated by the fraternity system for well over a century. It was suspended during World War II and then reintroduced. But the effect of the war, I think, had, uh, had a variety of impacts. Many of the veterans that came back found some of the fraternity antics uh, somewhat Mickey Mouse-ish. Uh, for the faculty, uh, led by Jim Burns, class of 39, uh, was hostile to the fraternity system in terms of viewing it as an anti-intellectual uh, uh, system. Jim had been the president of the Garfield Club uh, for those who did not join fraternities uh, in, in his time at, at uh, Williams. Um, and there was a certain amount of turmoil and tension in 1951, there was a trustee and faculty and alumni committee that recommended that, def that rushing for fraternities should not take place before freshman year, but should be deferred until the week before we all became sophomores, which meant that they had to find a place to feed the freshman class, which was when Baxter Hall was, was, was built. Uh, also in 1951, that same committee recommended that uh, uh, the fraternities should focus on total opportunity, which meant anybody who wished to join any one of the 15 fraternities should be able to do so. That was rejected ultimately on the basis that fraternities should not have to uh, uh, accept someone that they did not feel was appropriate for their membership. Um, and also in 1951, the Garfield Club decided that it would disband, uh, which was uh, itself something remarkable. During the spring of my freshman year in 1957, several things happened. Uh, Dave Phillips, class of 58, led a gargoyle study group that looked at fraternity charters and found that several of the Williams fraternities had restrictive clauses on either race or religion. And that became public in the spring. I remember very well the morning that <clears throat> we all woke up to find slipped under our door a memorandum from, uh, from the committee of 22, as it was called, quickly to be known as the terrible 22, uh, that recommended that the college abolish fraternities, take over the functions of feeding and dining and, and allocate uh, students to fraternities at ran uh, to uh, uh, residential facilities at random. Uh, in my, my class, when we were getting ready to go into rushing in the spring of 57, decided that we would not accept bids to fraternities until everybody in our class who wished to return, join any one of the 15 got a bid. There were 20 or 30 students who had to be classmates who had to be allocated to the 15 fraternities, which was done by the fraternity presidents, basically. Um, so we achieved total opportunity. Of, that was in, 50, uh, in the 57. Uh, Bruce arrived uh, in uh, 58, and uh, he, uh, by, by the spring of 61, he was the president of the AD House, uh, among many other distinguishing characteristics and leadership positions on campus. Uh, and as he said to me, as we were talking about this, that uh, uh, he and his, some of his classmates lit the fuse on that uh, coll collection of unhappiness that had been developing with the fraternity system. So Bruce, why don't you pick up on the lighting the fuse and where it started? Thanks, Steve. Um, by the uh, spring of my junior year, um, I had, uh, you know, I had progressed as a regular Williams student engaged in a number of different activities including sports and other volunteer committees. I must confess that uh, I believe I was uh, quite naive uh, at the time. Um, I came from Northampton. Uh, I don't believe there was a single black family in Northampton when I was growing up at the time. Uh, and when I came to Williams in 1958, uh, there were two black students and um, I believe uh, the literature tells us there were probably a quota on Jewish kids here. When I um, took over the presidency in the spring of my junior year, um, I was following in the footsteps of some pretty uh, 
uh, impressive leaders. Faye Vincent uh, was the uh, president when I was a sophomore, Dick Bradley when I was a junior. And, um, and so I, I, uh, I knew that there was a challenge. What I didn't expect was what occurred in April of 1961. Our fraternity had been assigned a international student. We had few international students at Williams at the time. Uh, the student that we were assigned family uh, fled North Korea to South Korea to the United States. His name was Myung Koo An, A-H-N. And um, at the time, of course, uh, we perpetuated the prejudice against Asians. We called him Charlie without thinking about the fact that that was a carryover from World War II, where all Asians were referred to as Charlie. But nonetheless, Myung Kuan came to our fraternity where he would enjoy any social activities. He had a special designation as a social member, which meant he could eat there and he could socialize there, but he couldn't sleep there, couldn't live there, if you will. Um, he, in some ways, turned out to be more of a brother in the fraternal uh, respect because the fraternities were owned by local fraternal corporations. And it was a separate business entity. The students uh, had to buy all the food, had to hire the cook, and others who worked had to buy the oil and had to take care of the grounds. Part of taking care of the grounds was volunteer. Myung Kuan volunteered for everything that came up. He seemed to love that part of fraternal life uh, as much or more than the full membership brothers. So in, in the spring of my uh, uh, junior year, my, I proposed full membership for him thinking, golly, he does as much or more than all the full members. Why shouldn't he have the opportunity to be uh, living at the house and to participate in goat room activities? So in April, uh, the April house meeting, his uh, full membership came up for a vote and uh, much to my horror, um, three people said, look, I like Charlie, but I couldn't live with him. And I, I didn't quite understand it. One of, one of them made a, a, a comment that if, I, I, if Charlie lived here, I couldn't bring a date here. And um, I, was, I was struck. I don't think I'd ever confronted any, uh, any forms of racism and, and, and uh, this, this just pushed me over the edge in the sense. Uh, the meeting broke up, it was a little contentious and I went back to the uh, freshman quad where I was a junior advisor and started talking to the other junior advisors to find out if this kind of thing happened at other fraternities. And the answer was yes, uh, but interestingly, you never heard about it on campus. People were either blackballed, that took a single vote to keep somebody out, or in the case of our fraternity, it took three people. That was called the butter system. I like him, but. Um, and so we decided, look, this, this, doesn't, uh, this just doesn't feel right. Let's talk about it. So we convened a meeting with other junior advisors and anyone else uh, who might be interested. Um, the first meeting was in the um, either the biology or the physics lab uh, 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 lecture hall, and we uh, I think we had maybe fifteen or twenty people there. But we decided that well, let's let's talk to more people and let's talk about a petition. The second meeting, a week or so later, produced probably thirty-five or forty, and by that time, uh, word was getting out on the campus that this people were serious about this particular incident and about the inequities in the system anyway. By the third meeting, we had a written document and we probably had 75 or 80 people of there, of there and some very outspoken um, grad, uh, undergraduates who wanted to reform the system within but were very much opposed to abolishing fraternities. The petition was circulated and out of what I would say were about 900 possibilities. We didn't include freshmen because they weren't permitted to enter fraternities until they were sophomores. 
out of about 900 potential signers, either 46 or 47 people signed this petition. Um, this now was about mid-May. The petition was submitted to then President Finney Baxter, who was completing his 23rd year as president of Williams. His term was up June 30th of that year. And I don't know what we expected Baxter to do. Uh, uh, we were hoping that uh, he might at least take a stance on this, but Baxter's position, uh, he made it clear to us. I believe we gave him the, the petition on a Thursday. He gave it back to us on a Monday you know, with the idea that the, he was just passing this along, that he came with 15 fraternities and he was leaving with 15 fraternities. So I think many of us felt, um, you know, that we had made a great run, uh, but that very likely we weren't going to make, uh, we weren't going to make many waves. Um, little did we know uh, that Finney's successor was a gentleman by the name of Jack Sawyer, who was a graduate of Williams, who'd been a president of a fraternity at Williams, and who at the time he was elected as president, was on, uh, came from the Board of Trustees. And I believe Jack was one of the youngest trustees to serve as a trustee at that time. Um, I was living in Northampton and I had a call from the presidential assistant at the time asking if I'd like to come to Williamstown to talk with President Sawyer about the petition. And so I got in the car, I still remember the day, it was Bastille Day. I uh, drove up here on July 14th and met with him and he uh, produced a document and said, told me that uh, he was interested in this petition and interested in following it up. And to that end, he had appointed a uh, committee called the Angevine Committee after its chairman, J.B. Angevine, a lawyer from Boston. And he handed me the list and I wanted to be pretty cool. I didn't look at the list right away. I, uh, and so we continued to talk and when it was over, I got in the car and drove out of town and pulled over uh, very shortly after that to look at the list. And I was a bit dismayed to be candid with you. There were only two people on the list that were post-World War II graduates of Williams. All the others were pre-World War II and all but one of the people on the committee uh, had been in fraternities. There was one gentleman, Freddie Nathan, who was a non-affiliate means he never was in a fraternity at Williams. And there were two undergraduates on the committee. I was on the committee and there was another student who was uh, a junior at that time um, who did not sign the petition who was on the committee. And um, so I wasn't, I wasn't encouraged to be candid with you at the time when I looked at it. Um, it turned out to be probably one of the most um, uh, made up of the most interesting, loyal, thoughtful Williams graduates that you can imagine. They already knew at, at their age that their loyalty, even though most of them were fraternity peoples, that they were, their loyalties in a, in a situation that were, they were presented with was with Williams, and they were very interested in doing what was in the best interest of Williams. I think it's important to know that at the time Jack Sawyer was elected president, um, he had been on the board for a while and probably was familiar with the petition presented by the terrible 22 and knew the history of protests of the inequities by other groups, mostly post-World War II. So I think Jack came with a concern about the viability, at least in terms of his view of the institution, of this kind of a social system uh, going forward. What, what is interesting in retrospect, and of course, as a 21-year-old kid, I didn't anticipate any of this. I just thought, okay, here's a petition. There's something wrong with this system. And um, maybe maybe uh, Williams will do something about it. Maybe they won't. 
what happened was the Angevine Committee met uh, when we came back to school in the fall, which would have been my fall of my senior year. The committee met here in Williamstown and opened the discussion to undergraduates, area alums, and others who wanted to, uh, who had something to say, uh, whether it was pro or con as far as fraternities go. It was a lively meeting. It was fairly respectful. Uh, sometimes it gets heated, uh, but we, um, we concluded that meeting and then uh, held another meeting later in the year. I think it was in December in the Williams Club in New York to give other alums an opportunity uh, to get to New York and to be heard. Now that meeting was not very friendly. Um, most of the people who showed up were very pro-fraternity people and um, they, they made their feelings known uh, in no uncertain terms. Um, I think the meeting went well after midnight and um, as a result of that meeting, uh, J.B. Angevine scheduled the next meeting for January um, in Williamstown. And it was at that meeting that he said he thought it would be helpful if we divided up in pairs and went to other colleges and universities to study their social systems to see what Williams might learn should it decide to move in a different direction other than maintaining fraternities. Um, I can remember I went up to Bowdoin with um, a gentleman by the name of Dick Debevoise, who was an outstanding uh, Williams alum, a lawyer, and a federal district court judge. Uh, and obviously, as a 21-year-old, I'm somewhat in awe of these people who are so verbal, so thoughtful, so uh, uh, so committed to the school. We, we spent uh, two nights in Brunswick, Maine, and... Um, he prepared a report for the other committees, uh, for the other committee members. And what we did was to share all the reports and to, um, and, and uh, J.B. Angevine at one point then um, prepared a document that summarized most of the salient comments about these other institutions and their social systems. We got back to together again in May. Now, Jack Sawyer, as I told you, came into uh, the presidency on July 1 of 1961, appointed the committee. The committee came back into uh, session in May of 1962. And we sat around and discussed a little bit of what had transpired and what other social systems were like in different universities. And then J.B. Angevine says, I think we have consensus, don't we? And I nearly fell off my chair because I never I don't ever remember getting a read on anybody as to the position, whether they were pro or con as far as fraternities go. And uh, everybody said, I think we do. And Angevine says, well, we'll prepare the report in a way that uh, uh, recommends to the trustees that they assume full responsibility for housing and feeding all students. Um, that was one of the most dramatic moves, I think, in the history of the school. Williams, uh, the original fraternities came to Williams in 1835. And over that period of time, there was a transformation. They were originally reading clubs. And of course, in the late 1800s, they became more social clubs and uh, had become full fraternity uh, eating and social uh, activities uh, in the early 1900s. But um, people had become used to coming back to here on weekends and to uh, having a uh, after football party in the fraternity houses and the feelings ran deep uh, about the fraternities. Um, what was impressive about Jack Sawyer was that he was handed an opportunity to move on the fraternity system. The, the very first month he came into uh, his presidency, there were a number of events, had they not occurred, 
I believe Jack could not have gone forward with the fraternity, uh, with the movement on fraternities that he did, when you think about it. Had Myung Kuan been assigned to another fraternity, this may never have been an issue. He may have been accepted as a full brother in, other, in another fraternity. Um, the undergraduates who signed this petition, <coughs> if anybody has had an opportunity to look at the petition and look at the signatures and to see the activities in which these undergraduates were involved, these young men at the time were among the best Williams has to offer. They uh, were serious students. Uh, some were presidents of their fraternities. Some were editors of the record. Um, they held, uh, many were gargoyles. Uh, many were junior advisors. Um, and so there was a gravitas to this group, I think, that allowed Jack to go forward with this petition in 1961. Had that petition been a petition that had been put forward only by non-affiliates, only by people not in fraternities, I honestly believe that Jack would not have risked it at that time. Um, the, and so there's another piece of the, the view of this thing, looking back as to why Jack took this lead then. It was a, it was a dangerous move. Finney Baxter had told Jack, stay away from the, fratern uh, the fraternity issue. It's like touching the third rail. But he did it. Um, the trustees approved it. And in later in 1962, there was the beginning uh, uh, of the outline on how Williams uh, would implement uh, the uh, new social system. Um, so looking, looking back on this, you have to recall, uh, know the fact that all the other schools of Williams size uh, uh, and of Williams uh, in what, what we now call the NESCAC schools, har hardly any of those schools touched the fraternity system until in the 1990s, if then. And it came with a struggle for most of them. <coughs> Um, go ahead, Steve. Yeah, no, I was going to say, I think that, uh, thanks, Bruce. Uh, we, we might have mentioned at the beginning, some, some people have mentioned in the chat, that John Chandler did a great little book called The Rise and Fall of Fraternities at Williams, which is uh, a very instructive one and talks more about some of the byplay outside of the Angevin Committee uh, from some of the members, including Bill Gates, who was a classmate of Jack's. And... Uh, Many of us remember him fondly as a as a faculty leader and a great and a great teacher. Um, I think yeah, the thing I would ask, I guess I'd ask Bruce, how much did you follow the implementation that the they 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 established a what they called the standing committee, and uh, by the time I got back to Williams, they, the joke was they called it the standing committee because they didn't dare sit down anywhere uh, because they were afraid they might be attacked. Um, but how much, I wondered how, how much you followed the implementation after that. One of the things I would say, Sawyer, I don't know how many times I heard him say over the years that I worked with him, sort of something to the effect that there are no panaceas in residential arrangements. There are no perfect, no perfect solutions in residential arrangements. And I'd say that uh, William's subsequent history has, has borne that out, uh, that uh, there have been lots of, app, uh, lots of efforts at it. But I wondered, Bruce, how much you followed that implementation. I, I did follow it. Uh, we moved back here in 1968. And I think that uh, at the time I was working for a local attorney, Larry Urbano, who was a, happened to be a Williams graduate and was the college attorney. And I believe that uh, his, his office, or Larry, was actually involved in the conveyance of the last fraternity that was, uh, whose property was gonna be conveyed to the college. But as far as the implementation goes, I heard the same stories that you've told. And in discussing this with John Chandler, who for many out there, John Chandler succeeded Jack Sawyer's president of Williams in 1975. 
um, John said that it was a most difficult um, adjustment simply because the college wasn't able to do so many of the things that um, they desired to retain about the fraternities. That is that small residential living. I think it was hoped at the outset that the uh, what the the houses that had been fraternities and had been now renamed in in uh, honor of uh, some alums or some college presidents and whatnot, um, we're hoping that they might be able to keep forty or fifty students in those residences and benefit. Uh, from uh, what being together in small living units was. Uh, the unfortunate thing was that it became, uh, uh, I guess, too expensive. Each one of the fraternities had full kitchen equipment and provided full meals, three meals a day. And so it became prohibitively expensive to maintain 15 separate kitchens uh, for the numbers of students that you could house in the uh, 15 fraternities. Actually, one of the fraternities was taken out of here fairly soon afterwards anywhere, torn down, taken back over to the Troy or Schenectady area. But the, uh, the, the, the arrangements were never completely satisfactory, uh, I understand, and that the college has uh, since then uh, <laughs> had a number of different tries at uh, how kids uh, want to separate themselves or be together in different social settings. So uh, it's been it's been a challenge. Um, so I, I honestly don't know. I wanted to make uh, one comment about the the real um, the real uh, stand up heroes in my mind of uh, if you want to call them that in terms of this movement anyway were really those people who post-World War II uh, were beginning to uh, see the effects of, um, of, of the uh, inequities in the system and the effect on kids who were here for only four years. Uh, I know one young man from Northampton where we came from who was, I believe, three years ahead of me in school. And he came to Williams College full of enthusiasm, loved it. And his sophomore year, after going through, uh, 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 what do you call it when you visit the fraternities anyway, it was, um, he went through that and did not receive a single bit, not one. Not one of 15 fraternities wanted uh, this young man who was a terrific uh, fellow. And he was so distraught that he uh, went to one of his professors and asked, what, what, do you, what do you think I should do? And the professor told him, I think you should transfer. Leave Williams. This is not gonna be a pleasant place if uh, you don't have a life outside of the fraternities. And he transferred to Columbia and had a wonderful life. Uh, but those kinds of things I think were beginning to surface in, uh, through the various groups who uh, were, were uh, committed to, to uh, uh, a reform. Yeah, one of the things that uh, I, I think uh, is, has come up in the Q and A, Bruce, and maybe you could speak to part of this in terms of the the fact. What was the faculty role in in these changes? Uh, just partly by way of background, the faculty I think was was uh, pretty clear from the reading that I've done and from John's book uh, that the pretty clear that the there was hostility on the part of the faculty to the impact that the fraternity system had on the intellectual life in the college. Not obviously not everybody and not universal, but the, but, it, but it had a uh, a non or indeed anti intellectual impact. So that 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 early post war period there was a lot of faculty activity um, and. Uh, when the, the trustees made, if I remember correctly, when the trustees made their final decision in 1968 to ask all of the, the few remaining fraternities to wind up, don't do no further rushing, that um, uh, the faculty uh, had a vote uh, to uh, agree with that particular line. 
but uh, you know, the two that I recall for sure, John, uh, uh, sorry, Bill Gates was on the committee with, with you, was he not? And uh, Hodge Markgraf, who was then a very young assistant professor uh, in the chemistry department, also an alum, also a fraternity guy was on there. Uh, I can't remember whether there was a third faculty member no, I think I think Bill was the only faculty. Uh, Bill and Hodge were the only faculty members. Yeah. Hodge was a non-voting secretary, right? Uh, and, yeah. um, but the it, it, it's interesting because I think the you're absolutely right. I, uh, I think for some uh, fraternities uh, who act, who you know, who controlled everything that went on in the properties, uh, that faculty were not invited, uh, were not. Uh, were not invited or not wanted on the fraternities unless invited by the Brotherhood. And that, uh, you know, that led to uh, the fraternities selecting who their advisor would be. And that advisor would come and have guest meals on Thursday night and, you know, might have a drink or two while, while they were there. And so I think that to, to that extent, the relationship with those faculty members was reasonably cordial. But I think outside of that little, outside of that particular contact, uh, there really wasn't uh, uh, much, the, 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 the environment was not particularly cordial to faculty. Now that's not true of all the fraternities, but that, I think that would be true for many of the fraternities. Um, One of the other things that's come up in the, in the chat, uh, Bruce, is uh, the, what was the relationship of the, the uh, Angevine committee and Jack's interest in that to the decisions later to two things. One, the decision to go co-educational and two, uh, the big push on the part of Williams and most of the other selective colleges in New England to increase the number of black students that were admitted. I mean, from my own view is that the fact that Williams did this before uh, uh, addressing co-education. It was the only one in, the, in, in New England and, and, and the Northeastern United States, only men's college that dealt with fraternities before dealing with, uh, with the question of co-education. Um, and it was also the only one that dealt with, with the fraternity system uh, prior to having relatively large numbers for the time of, uh, of black students. Uh, did any of that come up in the in the, uh, uh, in the I, I can't say that it, that it came up in, in the uh, Angevine uh, group meetings or at that particular time, but I know that um, at, at, I know that when the Angevine committee uh, completed its work, and I know that when the um, th that it marked Jack moved very shortly thereafter. Uh, I think that the full class of women was admitted in 1971 here and graduated in 75. So it fell right on the heels of the abolition of fraternities and the integration of a new social system here. It gave uh, Jack Sawyer the opportunity and some think that Jack came to the presidency with a bit of a plan in store uh, both for um, seeing an end to fraternity life at Williams and uh, for making the institution uh, co-ed. And um, what happened during that period of time, it's very interesting that Williams was the first uh, by many years to abolish fraternities. Right after it abolished the fraternities, uh, it began progress towards co-education which uh, started off with uh, a few uh, uh, undergrads from women's schools coming to Williams, but not getting a degree from Williams. And then they started admitting uh, 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 full classes of Williams, I think in 1971. Um, also at the time, I think I mentioned that when I came to Williams, there were probably two black students uh, when I graduated four years later, uh, there were certainly fewer than 10. But by 1968, uh, I believe uh, there were 38 uh, black students here. And 
thanks to Phil Smith and the admissions office, it gave him the opportunity to start looking at a more diverse undergraduate body. I think when you and I came here, Steve, I think it was 60% private school kids and 40% uh, public school kids. And that changed, I think, while we were here. Before I graduated, I think they had it flipped to 60% public schools uh, kids and 40% uh, private school. So yeah, I think it was all part of that same, the same movement, I think, uh, that, that uh, Phil Smith and Fred Copeland, uh, good solid Williams alums, uh, oversaw a fundamental change in what the, uh, what the, uh, uh, what the student body uh, looked like. Um, I think that the, one of the things that's interesting about uh, Sawyer was the way he kept counsel, his own counsel about things. He had a, his papers were sealed for 50 years. And he right. always dodged the question publicly about whether he had uh, co-education in mind before he came to Williams. And uh, now that his papers are public, you find that he was in the spring of 61, before he even got here, he was writing to the presidents of the women's colleges around New England and New York, inquiring about issues related to uh, education of women and co coordinate education and so on and so forth. So, uh, I mean, he was, in my experience with him, which was several years of working very closely, he was always about five moves ahead on the ch chessboard uh, from on, on every issue than anybody else. Extremely strategic. Steve, I see one interesting uh, uh, question in the yeah. Q&A, and it had to do with uh, the question asked, was any consideration given by Williams to the potential fallout among alums for support, financial support, which is, which is an, an interesting question. And the answer was, I'm assuming there was some given to it, but right after the trustees voted to accept the responsibility for housing and feeding all students, which essentially was the death knell of fraternities, a rump group among the alums wrote to every single graduate in Williams and asked for their normal annual fund contribution that it be sent to this rump group. And they felt as though if they could do that to any significant degree for two years, they'd be able to force Williams to take back the fraternity system. And here again, you see the respect that Jack Sawyer had among his, among, uh, uh, his alums. He was, uh, he was very well respected, uh, not only by his classmates, but by others. He went to, I'm told anyway, he went to three uh, alums uh, when this group uh, wrote this letter and said to him, this poses a very real threat. And they got together and they said to him, Jack, uh, we will guarantee that uh, you will get uh, by alumni donations, the same amount, the, the, at the very least, the same amount that you received last year. So had there been any, uh, any fewer, any, any uh, people, if, if any had contributed to this other rump group, this group was gonna make it up and make sure that William stayed even with the board. That, and uh, that ended in two years. They, they went away uh, and Williams was able to move on uh, with the implementation of the new social system. You know, one of the things that uh, now that we're in the 200th anniversary of the Society of Alumni, um, <clears throat> the society basically came into being to save the college when uh, the, the defectors of 1821 marched across the hills. Um, and I think that the, that the, the loyalty of the alumni uh, really came through. Ed Stanley was on the Angevin committee, if I remember right, uh, Bruce, uh, class of 37, Eddie, Eddie, Stan, Eddie Stanley, Eddie Stan. class of 37, yeah. Um, and he was, uh, he was a, pre a president uh, in, in the 60s. He was a president of the Alumni Society. And uh, I, you know, I, I was told by Jack that uh, at this Society of Alumni meeting uh, shortly after the Angevin Committee, I don't know whether it was the same 62 or 63, that uh, 
Ed uh, said, uh, you know, that uh, the, uh, the Angevin committee had made its report. Uh, he wasn't sure that everybody agreed with it, but it wasn't the job of the alumni to, to set policy for the college. That was the job of the, uh, the, the president and the trustees and the faculty. And our job as alumni is to support the college in what it's determined to do. And I think that the other thing that went right after, in addition to their story you tell, uh, Sawyer started the, the 175th anniversary fund right. um, and that went, and when I became provost, it was, they had made their goal. And so he was kicking off what he called phase two. Yeah. Um, and so one of the things that he, you know, to, to have uh, a, abolished fraternities and gone co-ed and increased the number of uh, African-American students and changed the curriculum and changed the calendar, et cetera, and still have record uh, alumni contributions was uh, quite a tribute to, to his leadership and to, the, and to the loyalty of Williams alumni. Yeah, it, it was extraordinary. Just to clear the record, I, I checked to see Eddie Stanley was was not on the Angevine committee. I thought he had been too. Ah, okay. He was an extremely yeah. influential alum at the time. I know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He was a late, later. He was a full trustee too. Yes, uh, he was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> um, I, I see. There's a comment from Wally Bernheimer. The class of '61 was the first one that went over 50 percent from public high schools. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. So that was that was my recollection uh, as well. That uh, there was just after just after uh, uh, we were admitted that they finally broke the broke that record. Yeah, but it's a fundamentally different uh, student body, and you can't. It's hard to think about how that the student body today uh, would function if you had a fraternity system that was anything like the one that uh, that you and I uh, experienced when we were were there. There's a question uh, about uh, uh, Bill Coffin, the, the, the uh, chaplain for a couple of years at Williams and then uh, sort of legendary chaplain at Yale. Um, he was very outspoken uh, against fraternities right. and in fact uh, uh, had, a, uh, had a shotgun full of pellets put through his window uh, at one point. Uh, Apparently, by someone, somebody in the in one of the fraternities, um, but uh, that was the. I think that the to, to your point, Bruce, that um, it was not the sort of uh, social activist types that that, that drove this. It was uh, the, the what you could call the solid citizens who who were part of the Williams student body establishment, the, you know, the athletes and the team captains and the junior advisors and Purple Key and Gargoyle and you know, record editors and so on and so forth. That, that the weight of that kind of group, I think, I, I agree with you, must have had an impact on the way Sawyer viewed things. Um, Yes, Some, someone has asked an interesting question about uh, how the um, Angevine committee arrived at this so-called uh, consensus. Um, I believe, um, here we were, there were two undergraduates on that uh, committee. I believe the Angevine committee did meet when we as uh, students, for whatever reason, our test papers, um, spring vacation or something, were not always present. So that there may have been some discussion among those uh, members uh, about um, where Williams was going, the direction that they were going to, uh, they want uh, the Angevine committee wanted to go, and uh, but in the meetings that I had been involved in as a student, and I think Rob would probably corroborate this, um, it was somewhat of a shock because we hadn't been part of any, uh, you know, long discussions about uh, what the recommendation would be, um, but um, it was a. Uh, it was a momentous occasion, and uh, uh, I must say that uh, the the, uh, the chairman J. B. Angevine has had one of the greatest minds that I've ever worked with. He had a way of distilling a lengthy uh, 
lengthy, lengthy conversation down to, uh, you know, a, a short page or two. When we went to New York for the New York meeting, Hodge Markgraf took 31 pages of notes that night. And I don't think we adjourned until 12 or one o'clock in the morning. And J.B. Angevine says, can you get me the, can you get me the distilled uh, notes by six o'clock or 6.30 because we're getting back together at 7.30. So Hodge distilled 31 pages down to 10. Angevine got it and presented it to us uh, in five pages. And uh, he had not missed any of the critical points of the uh, four or five hour discussion. He was, uh, I thought he was extraordinary. <clears throat> One other thing that uh, has come up from time to time, Bruce, uh, is in addition to the question of whether there were some side conversations among the non-student members, um, the, the question of what, what role Jack Sawyer played during the course of the Angevin committee deliberations and, and gathering of evidence and so on, uh, which he, he had always said, well, he didn't, he didn't engage with them. That was up to the committee. And I would just say as having someone who worked with him for very closely for a long time, I just can't believe that that was true. I mean, he was, he, he, uh, he kept, when we were, I was on the Lockwood committee uh, that studied co-education and uh, he never came to any of our meetings, but he sure as heck knew what was going on and uh, followed it extremely closely. And uh, that was- John Chandler will tell you that uh, he may have had uh, <laughs> some uh, discussions with J.B. Angevine or some of the others, yeah. uh, but he, he didn't, he gave me the impression that he did, Jack wasn't running the show, J.B. Angevine was running the show and was yeah. doing exactly what Jack had expected, that is, um, look, we're, we may be changing the social system at Williams and we should be taking a look at what other schools are doing. That would be prudent. So the idea of dividing them up and sending them out to other schools and then reporting back, I think was a, was a, a smart move and uh, certainly um, gave them an opportunity to come in and say, well, nothing here really fits at Williams. What we're gonna do is to assume the responsibility for housing and feeding everybody and work our way through what kind of a system we want here. Uh, mm -hmm. That was the ultimate uh, ultimate decision. We're gonna we're gonna switch back to uh, President Maud in a minute. Uh, anything anything final thoughts that you have to say, uh, Bruce? I'm so pleased to be able to to have this conversation with you. Uh, so I think that you you and your fellow students had a had had a huge impact on William's future. One question that might might be worth a bit is uh, how much blowback did you get as an individual? Ah, that's a that's an interesting question because when I received Maud's letter, I was I was stunned to, to be quite candid, uh, and it tended to uh, it was, I was a bit emotional because of uh, the uh, something may have uh, I think there were some painful moments. Particularly, I made a mistake. I think. Uh, I probably should have left the house. I lived in the house my senior year. I think it was probably difficult for those ADs who were very uh, pro-fraternity at the time to have someone in the house who was uh, moving in, in the direction they didn't want to go. That is against the system. And so I, um, I, uh, there were some aspects of, of senior living that were difficult. Uh, 84% of the undergraduate body wanted to maintain fraternity. So mm -hmm. uh, generally speaking, it was a, um, ah, it was a long year, <laughs> put it that way. Great, thanks. Thank you so much. Can we all just give a virtual round of applause for Steve and Bruce? Uh, it was so wonderful to hear that and to hear uh, all of the, you know, I'm a historian. I love to hear the, the oral history from uh, the source himself. So it was really wonderful to, to be able to hear that. Um, it is now my honor to confer the college's bicentennial medal to Bruce Grinnell, class of 1960. You were just doing what you thought was right for a humble working class kid from North Hampton, Massachusetts. It probably felt that simple. You couldn't have known that your actions in the spring of 1961 would alter the trajectory of your college and etch your name into Williams history. But that's exactly what happened. 
You were captain and quarterback of the football team, a junior advisor and president of your fraternity. You had hard earned social capital and weren't afraid to spend it when the inequities and injustices within the residential and social structures of the fraternity system were glaring. You weren't alone in seeing those, of course. Many before you had spoken up against that system or had their Williams experience negatively impacted by it in silence. You and a handful of fellow undergrads set out to make change. A first meeting drew under 20 students. The next saw that number double. A third meeting brought together close to 100 students, but now with voices in opposition to your efforts and attendance. A deeply thoughtful petition was written and it concluded in part by recommending the immediate establishment of a committee consisting of trustees, students, faculty members, and alumni to conduct a complete investigation of the social system. 46 undergrads signed on to what would become to be known as the Grinnell Petition. That document was on John Sawyer's desk when he began his transformative tenure as Williams president in July, 1961. Shortly after, you were one of two students named to the Angevine Committee formed by President Sawyer and the board to determine the role of fraternities. The rest, as they say, is history, and your college is forever grateful for the part you played in helping Williams move forward. In recognition of your distinguished achievement and service to your college, Williams is proud to honor you with its Bicentennial Medal. Now, if we were in person, I would place that medal over Bruce's head Tall as he is, it would be difficult, but I would have done it. <laughs> but I will instead simply pass it to him from our respective locations in Williamstown uh, to him where I believe it is now <laughs> arriving. Thank you, Mark. Thanks again for being with us tonight. We'll be honoring three more bicentennial medalists this academic year. Be on the lookout for those virtual programs later in 2022. Have a great evening. Good night. Good night.